Good morning. So, if you notice the pretty flowers, thank you, Bonnie, for straightening them up so they didn't fall on me. I also pushed them back so they didn't catch a flame on us. They came from Al's service yesterday, and they were left behind so that we could have the beauty of them today. There's also left behind some donuts out there because that was one of Al's favorite things are donuts. So, if you want one, you can have one today. We don't officially have snack, but be sure you get one if you want one. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for uh, the celebration that we have, the joy in our heart that comes only from Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you so much that you are faithful, that your plan is perfect. We don't have to understand everything. All we have to do is accept Jesus and his finished work. Believing in him and the things that he has done and the things that he will do forever and ever. We thank you and praise you for all of the things that you are doing. Father, we thank you for the time that we can be here. Lord, help us to be a light, especially in this time of the holiday season when people are searching so much and they don't even realize the real reason for the season, that it's all about your love because of your son that died for us. Father, we just thank you and praise you for the opportunity that we have to come and worship you, and not only to worship you, but for you to reside with us every single minute of every day. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, we lit three candles now. This is the third Sunday of the Advent season. Advent, I'll remind you again, is an expected, highly anticipated coming. And as Christians, we're not only celebrating Jesus' coming, arriving 2,000 years ago, but even more we're excited about the fact He's coming back, that we know that we will spend eternity with Him, that we know that all sin will be taken away, that there will be nothing but joy and peace. So we've lit the hope candle where our confident assurance is in Jesus Christ that we will spend eternity with Him. We've lit the faith candle because our faith is what brings this about, our trusting Jesus Christ, that His finished work on the cross satisfied God's wrath against sin, that He has given us the power to live a life that brings Him glory and honor, which we could never do on our own trying to live for the law and that we will have a home forever with Him for all eternity. The scripture we read for um, Al's funeral yesterday was from John 14, where he told us not to fear or worry, because we knew where He was going. And if He was going away, it was to prepare a place for us, and that He wanted us to be with Him, so He would surely come back. And that's what Al believed. And because Al believed it, then you can go back to John chapter 13 and you can see that he lived out what Jesus said his disciples would live out. That he lived out a life of love. Love to God and then love to others. You may not know it, but he gave up a lot of his life to raise his nieces. And it was so good to hear the loving, kind words that they had to say about him and the difference that he has made in their lives because he said, you know what, I'm going to take this seriously, what the Bible says, and think about others' needs over my own. I was really privileged to get to talk to them and everything that, that went about yesterday. And I'd heard him, heard him called Smitty before, but I don't know if you ever heard him called Uncle Bubber, but that's what they called him all the time was Uncle Bubber. So it was just it was really nice. Hope, faith, joy, and peace leads to the center candle, which is Christ that we live a life of purity as His disciples, as His followers, just as He lived a life of purity in this world. That means that you can't keep on doing the same things that you did before. You can't make excuses that I've tried and tried to, to put this sin away. You can't make excuses that you've got to live out this part of your life now and later you'll serve Jesus. Today is the day of your salvation and you are to work it out in fear and trembling. But also perfect love casts out all fear because you know that there is no fear of condemnation if you believe in Jesus Christ. 
What a wonderful place to be. A joyful place to be. The third candle is the joy candle. It's also called the shepherd's candle. That's why we read from the passage in Luke. Because the shepherd, lowly people, common people, they had no idea. They were doing their everyday work out in the fields and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. A messenger from heaven appeared to them and told him not to fear, because I don't know about you or I, but if, if an angelic being came, I'd at least be apprehensive. <laughs> Maybe not fearful, because I, I, I do have faith in, in Jesus Christ, but it would kind of unnerve me. <laughs> and I can't even fathom how bad it would unnerve me. But he said, do not fear, because he's not bringing a message of wrath or anything else. He's bringing a message of joy to all men. But if you read that scripture, and we will again in a minute, that there are some that his favor rests upon and there are some that don't. And the difference in that comes in the fact whether you truly believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is and what he says he has done, he has done. And what he says he will do, he will do. So that you can have confident hope that you know that your faith is secure, that you can be joyful even in suffering, and that you can have peace in any situation whatsoever, peace that surpasses any understanding that you have, because you are a child of God. The nation of Israel and the whole world were oppressed at the time that Jesus came the first time. The Roman Empire was conquering the world. And even if you were a Roman citizen, you were oppressed because of the, the government. Unless you were an elite or you were Caesar himself, the world was taken over and oppressed, especially the Israelites. They had lost hope. They hadn't heard from a prophet for hundreds of years. And Jesus came at exactly the right time. Scripture tells us that. And came to common lowly people, but he also came to shepherds that were watching their flocks in the dark. You ever thought about that? And we are called to shepherd one another, to take care of, to feed, to lead, to encourage, to teach. Not just me, pastor means shepherd, but we are all called to shepherd one another. Even in the darkest times, even when there's no hope, even if an angel of the Lord doesn't appear, because we know that the angel of the Lord has already appeared and told us to have great joy. <clears throat> was joy gone forever? It seemed like it was at that time, and it may seem like it is today, but we know that joy is here because we don't experience joy based on circumstance, do we? I know you know that, but it's hard to realize that when those circumstances come your way, isn't it? It's so easy to let circumstances suck your joy away, but there's no reason for it. No matter what the circumstance is, if you believe in Jesus Christ, then you are God's child. Nothing will ever separate you. Not a hair on your head will be harmed without God knowing it and being in His will and purpose. God will not abandon you. He hadn't abandoned His children then. He will never abandon you now. And then suddenly a messenger appeared from heaven. No forewarning, nothing else. And did not bring wrath, <laughs> which we would deserve, correct? The wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. An angel appeared in Luke 2 we read, and there were shepherds residing in the fields nearby keeping watch over their flocks by night. Just then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Wow. And they were terrified. That's the next words. Terrified. Because if you are still in your sin, your shame, your condemnation, you will be terrified. That's what we're reading in Revelation. 
It shouldn't terrify you and you shouldn't have to figure out all the answers. All you should realize from that is what the purpose of the revelation was to John, that these things have to happen, but then restoration will take place. And those who have put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ will live with him forever. So you don't have to worry about the bowl judgments and the trumpet judgments and the seal judgments. Whether you're here on earth or not, you don't have to worry about them. Because even if you go through suffering, it will be just for a short while. It will test and prove your faith. It will make you mature and complete. So even when you go through sufferings, it's okay. God is with you. He will never forsake you. And He will lead you through so that even in the sufferings, you reach out and cry out to Him and have a stronger relationship. I know that's tough to think about. I know it's not easy to do. But God uses everything to draw you to Him. Don't let things draw you away from Him. Don't try to put your trust and faith in created things. No matter how good those things are, even family and friends, put your faith in Jesus Christ. God loves you no matter what circumstance, what suffering you're going through. Scripture is clear about that. The reason that we suffer is because we chose to sin against God. But at just the right time, He sent Jesus, and at just the right time, He will send Jesus again. Plain and simple. So we have an urgency to live what we proclaim and to tell others about the joy, the hope, the peace we have because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 10 of Luke 2, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Being afraid means that you fear things of this world not God, because if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, perfect love, as I said before, casts out all fear of condemnation. You have nothing to fear from your Father, because He loves His children. So the angel said, do not fear. <clears throat> do not be afraid. Why? For behold, I bring you good news of great joy. Not just joy, but great joy. That will be for all people. Everyone is offered salvation. The sad thing is not everyone will accept it. The even sadder thing is many will cry, Lord, Lord, on that day. They thought they were saved, but they weren't. Because they still trusted in, and especially those that we're talking about in that verse from Matthew, they trusted in their works of righteousness. They did mighty things that looked like they believed, but in their heart they still didn't believe. That's one thing that pain and suffering will do. They will cause you to only trust in the Lord because all of your trust in everything else is robbed away. Job, the oldest book in the Bible, talks about this cosmic battle and all the things he went through. And it's so hard to understand that book. But as you read and understand the full storyline again, just like Revelation, you'll understand that God does love you and wants to redeem you from everything that you have brought upon yourself by sinning against God, the creator of all things. And as we read in Revelation, we see these different beings that we have no idea what, all, what they are. We don't know anything about the cosmic realms. I mean, a little bit because the Bible reveals it. But God is so great, awesome. I hate when people use the word awesome because awe is something that should be only applied to God. We watered those words down because we should stand in awe of Him because how awesome He is. And He loves us enough to send His one and only Son to die for us. Wow, why would I keep relying on my own ability to save myself? Why would I keep trusting in other things? Why would I want to whine and complain when I do go through suffering? I should rejoice and be thankful in everything. And I think Scripture tells me that. What was the news? 
Today in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Messiah that was promised. He is the Lord. Not your Savior only, but if He is your Savior, He will be your Lord. Where will you find this news? <clears throat> the city of Bethlehem. Verse 13 goes on to say, And suddenly there appeared with the angel a great multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom His favor rests. So just like in Revelation, you're seeing a host of angelic beings proclaiming this good news. It's too good, too awesome. It's a matter of great joy that angel armies had to come and sing about it. Are you singing and proclaiming it? Especially for your family at Christmas when you gather together. Is Jesus the center of your celebration? Or is giving presents, or the Christmas tree, or eating, or is Jesus the center of Christmas? Not the holiday season, but Christmas. That God's Son would come, humbly give up heaven, live a life of the, what He created to save them, to die for them, to empower us to live for Him, and then to live eternally. So where do you fit in this story of Christmas? Do you truly believe? Do you consider everything going on in your life, good and bad, as great joy because you've put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ? Well, James says in James chapter 1, verse 2, he gets started right off the bat after his introduction, Consider it pure joy. We've had great joy and pure joy already. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Wow. This same joy, the same word used, James says it right off to the church, probably the first letter written to the church. Consider it pure joy when you face many kinds of trials. And they were. The kind of trials they were facing kind of makes me feel like the trials I'm facing don't mean much. And he said, consider it pure joy. I can't imagine people coming in and dragging my family out of my house and killing them because of their faith in Jesus. And he said, consider that pure joy. Because you get to be an example of Jesus Christ who laid down His life for you. And you've got nothing to worry about because death only brings you into an eternity with God. So I, I have nothing to fear of men, nothing to fear of this world. What I have is an opportunity while I am still breathing to proclaim the love of Jesus by telling and by living. What else do I have but that obligation, as Paul says, to do that? An obligation not to live as I used to live, but to live set apart for God's glory because of what Jesus has done for me. So I've got to ask you, what brings you joy then? If sufferings of all kinds should bring you joy because of your firm foundation in Jesus Christ and the hope that you have because of your faith, that you'll have eternal peace and joy, what are you filling your life with instead that's bringing you joy? Good question. Come on, I'm asking it to myself too. Because there are many things I can think of that bring me joy. And when the absence of them is not there, I do struggle with my joy, and it always leads me back to God, back to His love for me, but it's not easy for me to get there. But it always brings me back to the foot of the cross and what Jesus has done for me. It's so easy and so natural to say, why me, Lord? But we don't know how God is working these things out. It's not easy to go through suffering. It hurts. But Paul said to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, 
Holy and acceptable unto God is your reasonable act of service. And we do that by letting the Spirit transform us by changing our mind to change our hearts so that we don't think the same way anymore so that we realize that the things God gives us are for His glory and His honor to be rich to others, to be thankful to Him. And when things come along that hurt those things that bring us joy, that we still rejoice and thankful for what we had. And we long to Him to take care of us and bring us the joy that we have not created things. When we start going down that road, Satan starts tempting us to find our pleasure and our confidence and our faith in created things rather than the Creator. So I have to ask now those things that you think about, do they really bring you joy? Because how would you feel if they're taken away from you? Would you still have joy? There's so many things that make people lose their joy when they're taken away because they put their faith and confidence in things instead of the Creator. If you get it all stripped away, was it last week we sang it as well or the week before? And Debbie mentioned that. He had it all stripped away from him. But he said, it is well with my soul. I can't fathom some of the fantastic testimonies of people who have lost so much for Jesus and consider it pure joy. It humbles me, draws me closer to the cross and, that, and gets me to say to God, not my will, but yours, because that's exactly what Jesus said. So what does joy mean then? And what does pure joy mean especially? Suffering and joy are not thought of going together by the world. But Scripture's clear, they are. Suffering and joy are right there side by side each other. Wow! Because God sent His only Son and He suffered for us and He considered it joy to accept the cross. Not just the pain, the physical pain, but the rejection of his people, the humiliation, the rejection of his friends, betrayal of one that was spent three years close by his side, the rejection of Peter, denying him three times. He, did, he willfully accepted all of that and considered it joy. Why? Because of the outcome. You and I could become children of God. Do you consider suffering to be pure joy? Joy is another one of those words that's commonly used and it's misused and misunderstood as, as a uh, result. The word in the Bible is kara in the New Testament. It's a Greek noun which means joy, joyous, an occasion for joy, gladness, delight, cheerfulness. Joy is, and this is a definition from preceptaustin.com, Joy is a feeling of inner gladness, delight, or rejoicing. Joy in the New Testament is virtually always used to signify a feeling of happiness that is based on spiritual realities. It is independent of what is happening to you or will happen to you. Joy is an inner gladness, a deep-seated pleasure. It is a depth of assurance and confidence that ignites a cheerful heart. It is a cheerful heart that leads to cheerful behavior. Joy is not an experience that comes from favorable circumstances, but it is God's gift to believers and goes hand in hand with suffering. Don't forget that. Joy is a part of God's very essence and is dis discussed below His Spirit is and as discussed below His Spirit manifests this supernatural joy in His children. Joy is the deep down sense of well-being that abides in the heart of the person who knows all is well with their soul because they have been made right with God. That is what your joy is. And it comes from the finished work of Jesus Christ. And He's beyond all time and everything. His finished work means that He will come back and take you for His very own. What a wonderful thought. And the common shepherds got to get that announcement first. Not the kings, not the religious people, not anybody else, but the ones that were just doing their work, and their work was tending to the sheep. 
Joy is kind of different than the other candles because you've got to put that suffering along with it. You have hope because of your faith. Jesus is the one that suffered so that you could have that faith and have that hope. But now your joy comes in the midst of suffering with Him because your King and your Lord suffered with you. And you will find peace in it now and for all eternity. If in fact, you joyfully suffer with Him. Think about that a little bit because it's all throughout Scripture and the church is afraid to teach it so much today in this country. They want to teach instead that if everything's going well with you, you're doing what you need to do. But that's against the example of the church. That's against what Scripture teaches. Because the more that you stand up for Jesus and find your joy in Him, the more Satan is going to attack you, to try to destroy you, to distract you, which is exactly the examples we saw and the reason that the letters were written to the churches. And the reason that John is now having this revelation and writing it down. You just read how bitter it was going to be, but how sweet it was when he ate the scroll. And if you didn't understand that, that means that he ate it so that he could belch it up is what it means and preach it to us. And it would be bitter because of the suffering, the things that would happen, but it would be ever so sweet because of the victory that comes in Jesus Christ. And we have to share that with one another so that they can taste the bitter sweetness of it all. We have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard, all of us. But God has loved us and He offers salvation through Jesus Christ for all eternity. Bitter, sweet. Unsaved people don't have any hope because they don't have any faith. The joy that they think they have is not joy. And you see that all throughout this world. Because the more people get things, the more they are just empty in their life. And the more they're searching for Jesus. And the more reason they need to see Jesus in you. See by your actions, especially in the midst of suffering, so that then they can ask you the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. But how do you explain joy in the middle of suffering? Joy that came because of Jesus' arrival, joy that is with you because Jesus is living in you, joy that is with you because Jesus will live for, with you for all eternity. How can you explain that if suffering gets the best of you? And you mope, groan, complain. How do you explain the joy that you're supposed to have then? If you ask a lot of people, that, especially unsaved people, one of the things that Christians should be is joyful. They don't say peace as much, but they should be nice and loving and kind and happy. And when you see somebody that's that way in all kinds of circumstances, it's easy to relate them to knowing Christ. When yet, that doesn't necessarily mean anything in this world. Because many Christians are... Hurr. And there are many people that are joyful all the time. And you ask them about Jesus and they have got no clue. <laughs> we are the ones that are called to be joyful. Different. That's why the candle's pink. At least that's why I'm going to tell you it's pink. You read about it and stuff and yeah, there's no good answer. <laughs> it's just tradition. But it's different because we are supposed to be different looking in the world because of the joy that we have in every circumstance. Because of our faith that leads to our hope, because of the peace that we have for all eternity. And this year will be even more of a time for you to show your joy. Because every holiday season, there are a lot of depressed people. And this year is going to be even worse. And there are going to be people that don't get to see family and friends and everything else. Your joy needs to shine. And shine differently from people that have joy that's temporary because it's based on created things. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9, Paul writes, Rejoice. Now that's the verb part of the uh, Greek word. It's Cairo. It means the same thing as the noun, but put into action. If you have joy, you can't help but rejoice. 
And where does your rejoicing come to? Where does it come from? Where does it lead to? Oh, God, because of Jesus Christ. And if the world sees that, they cannot deny it. Especially when you're joyful in suffering. Because that has proved, just as Scripture said, that has proved your faith. It has made you more secure. It helps you handle the next situation. And as Paul also writes, you wouldn't know comfort unless the Holy Spirit comforts you. And the reason that He comforts you is so that you can comfort others with the same comfort that God gives you. Wow. But Philippians says, Rejoice. Again, and rejoice in the Lord always. Oh, I will say it again, rejoice. So not only does Paul say it once, he says it twice. And not only does he say it twice, but he says, I'm going to say it twice. Now that means listen up, right? Let your gentleness be apparent to all. It's hard to be gentle, kind, whatever words you associate with that. Think about it a second. When you're upset, when you're distraught, when you're fearful because you don't have joy. And think about what the opposite of joy is. Get there, because we'll go there in just a second. Because I think, anyway, the opposite of joy is anger and everything. The opposite of joy is not having the peace. Because I'm fearful, so it'd be fear. But we'll get into what the opposite of joy is in just a minute. Let your gentleness be apparent to all. Why? The Lord is near. There's the answer to it. Jesus Christ will return. Don't worry about the sufferings you're going through. He will return soon. And He will wipe every tear away. It doesn't matter if you go through these things in Revelation or you don't. He will be there at the end and you will forever be with Him. And there will be no more suffering. No more pain. No more tears. Verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God. And the peace, the next candle, you can see the progression, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think of these things. These things come because you are rejoicing because you truly have joy. You try to put any things, other things in there and you don't have joy, they won't happen. You have to have joy first that comes from Jesus Christ and you have to rejoice because of the joy you have. You have to obviously light your candle differently and shine differently to the world so that they know your joy is the real thing. And the only way that they can have that joy is to have faith in Jesus Christ because God loved them so much that He sent His only Son. Think of these things. Verse 9, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. We're getting to the peace candle next week. You're not going to have true peace if you don't have joy, inner joy, because you don't really realize that good news that the shepherds brought so long ago. You might think you do. You might do mighty miracles in your name, in His name. But He might also say to you, depart from me because I don't know you. There's no stating your case then. Do you have joy in your heart today and are you rejoicing same thing, just noun and verb. Do others see the joy that you claim? Is that joy evident in your life? Paul said, let your gentleness be apparent to all. Not just your family, not just your church, but all. Doesn't that include your enemy? All. Are you then rejoicing so that that joy is apparent to all. So what does the word joy mean in biblical terms? Extreme, great, and wondrous happiness that leads to peace, if you haven't figured that out yet. Nothing else will provide it. It leads to eternal peace, now and forevermore. I asked you before what you thought the opposite of joy is. 
sadness, fear, whatever things you came up with. You know what the opposite of joy is? Lost, unsaved. Because you cannot have joy if you don't know Jesus. There's your true opposite. Because only Christians, those that are set apart, only Christians have joy. There will be many on that day who look like they had joy. And he'll say, depart from me, I don't know you. Joy is the opposite of unbelief. If you believe, you have hope, you have faith, you have joy, you will have eternal peace. Jesus came once his first advent. He will come the second time, his second advent. At the last trump, whether it's pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, <laughs> doesn't matter. You don't have to have all the answers, and I'll take you right back that to again as Jesus' disciples that walked the face of the earth with him. They said when Jesus was, they didn't know Jesus was ascending at that point either. They said, are you now going to establish the kingdom of Israel? And his answer back was not a discussion with them. His answer back was, you don't need to know. Don't try to find all the answers to everything. What you do need to find out is how to have joy, how to have peace, how to trust in the Lord, to live as His hands and feet as His disciples. The Great Commission tells us that. To go tell others and to make disciples thereof and train them up. Not to teach them theory or doctrine that you call it or whatever, but to know the joy that you have and to live out that joy. This candle is so important in the life of Christians. Whether or not you're really in Christ or not. Because you won't have joy if you're not in Christ. And a telltale sign of that, Scripture's clear, is that you have pure joy in all and every type of suffering. You may not have it at first. You may cry a little bit, moan at first, but it will come because you have that peace. You'll find that joy. Because you know that no matter what you face in this world, it will be well with your soul. Joy is extreme and lasting happiness that you can only do one thing about. Rejoice. Just like the video said last week, what do you got to do when you face, you know, those sufferings come? You've got to face it. You've got to persevere. You've got to. That proves the test. Joy is trusting in God. If you don't have joy, you're not trusting in God. You're fearing men rather than fearing the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. A Christian must have joy and be joyful and be rejoicing. Some more words from James. Verse 2 said, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Allow perseverance to finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. And then in verse 12, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Do you remember Jesus' letters to the church? In Revelation 2, he spoke of that crown again. He said, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer tribulation for 10 days. We don't have to know what that 10 days means exactly. What we need to know is that suffering is a part of a Christian's life, to build character and perseverance, to prove their faith. And when that suffering is over, Jesus will comfort you. He will wipe every tear. He will take it all away. Be faithful even unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Oh, I can't wait till that day when Jesus gives me the crown of life and says, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you know what Jesus said was the opposite of well done, good and faithful servant? Go back and find the parable if you want to read it. You wicked servant, throw them away from me forever and ever. 
You're either a good servant, you're either a sheep, a shepherd, or you're the opposite. James' words were clear. No matter what, we have to have, our joy has to show that we rejoice because we have faith and hope, no matter what. And Jesus even rejoiced in his suffering. He counted it as joy that he could go to the cross for us. Another first Advent account can be found in Matthew chapter 2, the Magi. They looked for the signs and the stars, and they came because they saw this prophecy being fulfilled. And you may see many of the prophecies being revealed now in Revelation. They saw this prophecy being fulfilled and in Matthew 2 verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced. Same word. They hadn't known about Jesus coming to die on the cross. Neither had the shepherds. They didn't have an angelic voice. They simply looked at prophecy and creation and said, God is faithful. They rejoiced. On coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother Mary. They fell down and worshipped him. Because part of that joy that we have will lead to pure worship. You won't call Jesus your Lord. You'll do as, script, I mean, as Savior. You'll do as Scripture says. And you will call him Lord. Because of what he's done for you. You will have joy and you will rejoice. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts rather than wanting what they could get from the Savior. They presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The biblical definition of joy is a choice that you have to make. But it's not something that you have to do. It's just like salvation all the way around. You've got to make the choice to do it, but the joy comes from your inward being of God bringing His Spirit to reside with your spirit. You simply need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Jesus. You need to let the Spirit give you the guidance that you need to saturate you through and through, to change your mind, to change your heart, so that you are that new creation in Christ. You don't have to make that joy yourself. It comes from God. And when you realize that, it will expel out of you because it comes from God. And you will be His witnesses to the utter ends of the earth because you rejoice. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gladness be apparent to all. Why the Lord is near. Now pay attention to these things. Be anxious for nothing. In everything, with prayer and understanding, by prayer and understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You don't have to worry about it. God will guard your heart for you. Finally, brothers, He will do this for you because you're a new creation in Christ. You couldn't do this before, but you can now. But you have to choose to let the Spirit do it for you. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is admirable, anything that is excellent or, pra or praiseworthy, think of these things. Whatever you have learned or received from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. And don't forget, consider James's words, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. <laughs> And certainly don't forget Jesus' words from Revelation. Do not fear for what you are about to suffer. Be faithful even unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Do you have joy? Will you let this joy rejoice through you? Will you let this joy rejoice through you in every circumstance? And don't beat yourself up. We all fall down. Don't even try to pick yourself up. Let Jesus lift you up and rejoice that He will. Don't try to do it on your own. You will fail. But let Jesus do it in and through you and your joy will be apparent to all. 
Remember Paul's words, let your joy be apparent to all. Why? Simply because you know that the Lord is near. You know that you are His child. You know that the work was finished on the cross. And in whatever time frame, it will be finished for all eternity and you will spend eternity with Him. If you know Him. Revelation eleven fifteen. I'm going to give you a little preview of what you're going to read tomorrow. Then the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and loud voices called out into heaven, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. You're getting to a transition point. You're going to see some more judgments and everything, but you're going to see the hope that we have unfolding. And if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, your hope will become sight. So be joyful. Rejoice. Especially during this holiday season. Especially even in the times of suffering. So that not only your brothers and sisters see it, but the world sees your faith, your hope, and the peace that you have in Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the joy that comes from knowing Jesus. He considered the cross something of joy for him. Lord, let us not complain about our circumstances and especially about our suffering. But Lord, let us lead it to be more dependent on you, to not to fear the things of the world or, or to put our faith and trust in them, to put our faith and trust in you and to fear only you and to gain wisdom and knowledge. And not by our own power or our own might, but by the Spirit transforming us to be mature and complete, to be more like Christ. Lord, let us not waste this life, but bring glory and honor to you by being your good and faithful servant. And Lord, we long for the advent of Jesus for his return. We thank you and praise you that you are faithful and true. We put our trust, our hope in Jesus Christ, and we thank you for him. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.